Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. We're going to continue right where we left off with Extra History's story of Japanese militarism. Occasionally you're going to see the folks from Extra History show up in the comment section. They do kind of show up here every so often, so glad to have them and highly recommend their channel. There's a reason they are one of the channels I react to the most because they have a, a wonderful array of historic topics and the way they tell a story is so immersive and engaging and interesting that I just can't get enough of it. So I definitely recommend you check out their channel. The link is in the description to the original content, as well as a link to my reaction to episode one so you can get caught up. Let's go ahead and dive in. Yokohama, September 1st, 1923. A city of liberal ideas like labor unions, women's rights, and democracy. A city that smells of foreign delights like chocolate and cigars. A city about to be destroyed. And so we're just... As a quick refresher, remember, we are only a couple generations removed from a society that's closed to the world, that's all about the samurai and that warrior culture and, you know, the shogunate and that kind of thing. And just within a couple of generations now, they have completely transformed almost into like a Western kind of society. Uh, and, and then, of course, sometimes... Uh, progress and a change in direction can be halted or radically transformed by a major event and that's what we're going to have happen here the ground shakes for 14 seconds and in that time most of the western concrete buildings collapse crushing hundreds and though most traditional buildings are wood soon fire rages through mm. the city dazed survivors stagger around coated in white dust but it's not over a 40-foot tsunami smashes into the coast ships are washed down streets and deposited on roofs then another wave follows, and another. The sea drowns or sweeps away thousands. Within minutes, Yokohama lays in almost total ruin, and the destruction continues inland to a place only 17 miles from the port city, Tokyo. So I'm, I'm going to just kind of guess a little bit here. And just try to put myself in the mindset of some people. I don't know a lot about Japanese culture. I know that in European cultures, that if you had radical transformation happening like this at this time in history, you would probably have some people saying, this is punishment, or this is a sign, or this is somehow has something to do with the fact that we're making all these changes and maybe we shouldn't have, and maybe this is like a wake-up call to us. But I don't know if they would interpret it that way or not. Thanks so much to Curiosity Stream for helping us share today's historical tale. The destruction rages on. In Tokyo, a city still made largely of wood and rice paper. Buildings ignite into district-wide infernos. Fire brigades try to respond, but the tremors have broken all the pipes. In an apocalyptic mm. scene, residents evacuate to a clear area beside a river, but the city around them is a firestorm, and the rising heat combines with the high winds to create a fire whirl the size of a tornado. Of the 140,000 killed, this one freakish accident will account for around 40,000 of them. Wow. And for a certain segment of the Japanese right wing, this was divine retribution for Japan flirting go. with Western ideas. And this is not unique to Japan. Like I said, I anticipated this only because I know that's probably what, what would have happened in in European cultures. Uh, or in any, any culture, really. I mean, a lot of this stuff gets interpreted that way. Allowing socialists and anarchists to operate and sabotaging the military's achievements abroad in Korea and China. In fact, in the aftermath of the earthquake, mobs hunted and murdered Koreans and anarchists mm. in retribution for the destruction. Now, that might sound strange, but ultranationalist groups had been active in Japan for decades, including some who practiced paramilitary or intelligence activities. So again, I'm just trying, kind of thinking out loud here a little bit. When you have radical reform, the, the, the more radical the reform, the more radical the change that happens the more radical the backlash or the opposition to that change will be. You know, if it's small changes, you might have small opposition. You make radical changes, this is what you're going to see. So uh, huge upheaval, huge change in society. People who are more traditional, who want things to stay the way they are, go back to how they were and uh, feel like their voices aren't being heard or feel like they have no control over the situation, they're going to resort to desperate means uh, or punish whoever they think is responsible for this. 
Two of the most prominent, the Black Ocean Society and the Black Dragon Society, were especially concerned with countering the threat from neighboring Russia and China. A decade earlier, they had entertained a more pan-Asian view, encouraging and sheltering Sun Yat-sen in the 1911 Chinese Revolution, but they increasingly saw Japan not just as the natural leader of the Asian nations, but its colonial master. And those who believed that military expansion was the key to national and economic security were known as militarists. But in the early 1920s, they were an extreme fringe. So let's talk about this for a second because you see the same kind of thing, maybe similarities, I don't want to say it's the same thing, happening in Germany about this time when you see the rise of, of fascism there. Um, definitely a different form. But what happens is when, when you grow or when the focus of... Uh, your nationalism is on military expansion, uh, then you have to use that military, right? And so that's why you start having to invade other countries. And once you invade and conquer those other countries, you've got to invade something else because you have built your entire identity on that idea. Um, I hope I'm trying to explain, I'm explaining this well. I, I, I don't want to go too deep into it, but... Um, you basically have to keep feeding that, is what I'm trying to say. And there was no ultra-nationalist or militarist party in the Diet. Between 1912 and 1927, Japan entered a period of reform known as the Taisho Democracy, named after the ruling emperor. And part of that opening of society involved the rise of political parties. Now, there were a lot of parties, but we're going to focus on two today. The Conservative Sayukai, or Association of Friends of Constitutional Government, and the Liberal Kensekai, or Constitutional Politics Association. You actually met the Sayukai last episode. It was the party of Hara Takashi, the prime minister assassinated in a Tokyo train station. They claimed to be liberal, but were really more of a center-right bureaucratic party, believing in big government, large public spending, and opposing social reform programs. They also flirted with the militarist and ultra-nationalist right, positioning themselves as pro-military and largely in favor of colonialist projects. The Kensakai, by contrast, was a center-left party who backed labor unions, supported economic reforms for farmers, and stood against the rule of oligarchs. Their biggest policy proposal was universal male suffrage, hmm. but they'd also been kept out of power by oligarch machinations prevented from forming a government even when they won the majority. And because the conservative Sayukai held the majority from 1900 until just after Hara's assassination in 1921, you'd think the ultra-nationalists would be happy. Well, not so much. For these men, the moderate conservatives were almost as despised as the leftists. Huh. See, before Hara, the prime minister was usually a retired general or admiral and extremely friendly to the military. Ultranationalists also hated how Japan had joined the League of Nations after World War I. They thought it was... Ultranationalists, I'm going to guess their idea of nationalism was a strong Japan that kind of goes back to what they were before, right? Where they're kind of more isolated from world affairs and joining the League of Nations is being very kind of, I guess, maybe viewed as more interventionalist, uh, maybe just kind of not what they it want. It was a policy that did nothing but restrain Japan from acting decisively and uh, unilaterally in its own interest. Okay, so by joining the League of Nations, they are restricting what they can do because they're, they're basically giving tacit support to the idea that the League of Nations as a whole is going to kind of police the world, and that's going to restrict Japan's ability to grow uh, and expand. And it's interesting that that's the case because then Japan's expansion in the 1930s through military conquest is going to be one of the death knells of the League of Nations. They argued that Hara hadn't even gotten the Paris Peace Conference signatories to affirm a statement of racial equality among the members. The UK and US. And you know who's in big part to blame for that? He who must not be named. You know who I'm talking about. Shot it down. For a period, the ultranationalists got excited at the prospect of the Siberian intervention when Japan joined a multinational force attempting to stabilize the Russian Civil War. The army had hoped to keep Siberia, fashioning it into a buffer state against Russia. But Hara shot that plan down. And when he brought Japanese forces home, the military's perspective was that it wasted 5,000 men without gaining anything. Mm. But even after Hara's assassination by an ultra-nationalist sympathizer, he left them with one final indignity. He'd already dispatched a representative to the Washington Naval Conference. Uh. In an agreement meant to stop a naval arms race, Japan agreed to limit its navy to a size that Japanese admirals considered insufficient to defend Japan and its colonies. You're an island nation. You're, you're like the... The eastern version of the British Empire, right? 
you are an island nation that's not only going to require a very strong professional land force, but uh, especially a, a strong navy. And you're probably looking to Britain and saying, well, if they can have it, why can't we have the same thing? Sure, it was true that China was so divided by warlords at the time, it couldn't mount a naval threat. But the United States had several colonies and naval bases in the Central and Western Pacific. Though that wasn't their biggest worry. It was actually Soviet Russia that scared the ultranationalists most. It was big, powerful, and in one place, only 28 miles from the Japanese home islands. Plus, mm. Russia posed an ideological threat. While Japan had already suppressed the Japanese Communist Party and driven it underground around the turn of the century, ultranationalists always feared it would rise again, especially after 1923, when a communism-influenced student tried to assassinate Crown Prince Hirohito. Wow. Revolution, it seemed, was in the air. Imagine what that might have meant. Hirohito is the emperor during World War II, and all the way up until, I think, the 1980s, he is emperor. Uh, just imagine the direction shift that might have occurred if that assassination had been successful. Here. In 1918, riots over the price of rice had exploded across the country, leading to popular violence, labor strikes, and even the bombing of police stations. Plus, the Siberian intervention made things worse, as the government bought stocks of rice to supply its troops. And what's going on in 1918, end of World War I, Russian Revolution, uh, beginning of the flu pandemic, which I don't know how much Japan was affected by that, but I think that's the kind of thing we need to look up. So it looks like Japan was not as badly hit by other parts of the world. The estimate, the conservative worldwide estimate is 1.7 to 2.8% of the population. I've seen numbers as high as 5% of the world population died during the flu pandemic. In Japan, um, it looks like deaths are 250,000 to about half a million, which would put it at less than 1% of the population. So it did hit Japan. I mean, hundreds of thousands of deaths is hundreds of thousands of deaths, uh, but significantly less than many other parts of the world experienced. I should mention, too, that that art article also pointed out that the numbers in Japan were actually pretty similar to numbers in the United States and Canada and some other countries, so uh, not hit as badly as some parts of the world were. And then, in 1923, the Great Kanto Earthquake wrecked both Yokohama and Tokyo. This necessitated a massive rebuilding effort that sucked up government funds, while meanwhile, inflation was squeezing the urban class. Mm. And that economic difficulty, and the dissent it caused, helped promote liberal opposition parties like the Kensukai, which won enough seats in 1924 to create a hung parliament and a three-party ruling coalition with the Sayukai. But given how much they had to compromise, the Kensakai's reform plan had to stay moderate. They passed universal male suffrage in 1925, hoping to move the country away from the oligarchs and passed some economic bills. Yet under pressure from their allies, that same year, they also passed the Public Security Prevention Law. This allowed the government to jail anyone for 10 years if they formed or joined an association aimed to alter the Kokutai. The but who determines which associations are counted in that and how do they determine whether or not you're officially a part of it. Interesting. It sounds like this is the kind of thing that could be abused to jail any of your political opponents. National body with the emperor at its head or act against private property. Now, it was clearly aimed at communists and socialists, but considering its vague language could come to be used on anyone. Yep. But while there they had go. to compromise in the diet, the Kensakai could push a more liberal platform in foreign relations. As foreign minister, the liberal Kijuro Shidehara defined Japanese diplomacy in the 1920s, pursuing amicable relations with mm. Britain and the United States, and non-intervention in China. When trouble occurred, he usually evacuated Japanese citizens rather than sending troops. Even as Chinese... And that's interesting that he did that, because it is a pretty common tactic, right? We saw the Americans do this when you are concerned about Americans... Um, who might be in harm's way, you know, when, when Japan invades and they start attacking Nanking and there are American civilians there, the U.S. sends in military to help protect them. So it's, it's a very non-interventionist policy and it's a very kind of more peaceful solution to say that rather than ramp up the tensions and send my military into a tense situation in order to protect our interests there, I'm going to pull our people out. That is definitely communicating that you're trying to avoid conflict and not ramp it up.
nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek, who the ultra-nationalists considered a Russian puppet, consolidated control in China. Xi Dihara stayed out of it. He refused to join with allied nations in threatening retaliation when Shang's forces attacked several embassies. But Shidihara's hesitation to use troops, and the government cutting the army by four divisions, angered both the military and the public. Some ultra-nationalist and junior military officers even started to go as far as saying parliamentary government was un-Japanese. Mm. And then, financial panic hit. After the Great Kanto earthquake, the government had offered earthquake bonds to the big banks at a massively discounted rate. The idea being they could lend money to help with the rebuilding. But then by 1927, Japan was in an economic slowdown, and the government floated, making those bonds come due. The result was financial crisis. Citizens made a run on banks, withdrawing their money. Smaller banks collapsed overnight, leaving the market controlled by the big Zaibatsu corporations, many of which had political or family links to members of the Kensakai. I don't want to read too much into this, but I wonder if things like this happening in 1927 had any sort of ripple effect uh, into what ends up happening in 1929 with the stock market crash and the uh, fall into depression, because I know that that did not happen in a vacuum in the United States. It's just like right now, it seems like everybody in the United States keeps talking about and focusing on inflation here in the U.S. as though it's not also happening everywhere else in the world. When I was just in Belgium a few weeks ago, several people there in Europe were asking me, are you guys having any issues with inflation there? Because it's really bad here in Europe. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, because it didn't even occur to me that they didn't realize, yeah, it's happening in the U.S. And a lot of people in the U.S. don't realize, yeah, it's happening in Europe. Uh, so I, I feel like this probably is either something that helped spur that on or was also a part of the same kind of worldwide thing that was happening that leads to that. Shidihara, for example, was married to a daughter of the man who founded Mitsubishi. It was not a good look, and the prime minister was forced to resign. His Sayukai successor, a general, lost no time in rolling mm -hmm. back the tide of liberalism. Within a year, he'd used the public security preservation law to arrest thousands of known and go. suspected communists across Japan. That law is probably okay as long as you have somebody who exercises restraint and uses it responsib responsibly. But the second you get somebody in there who's willing to... Let's see how far we can go with this law. Let's see what the limits are. Let's see how much we can stretch this. Who can we go after before people start really speaking out against it? And planned for a more aggressive, interventionalist stance in China. It was a new era, quite literally. Because the next year, a new emperor, Hirohito, came to the throne, beginning the Showa period. And radicals in the Imperial Japanese Army would start taking matters into their own hands. Here we go. All right. It's getting good. It's getting interesting. I love learning new things. I hope you guys are enjoying it along with me. Those of you who know more about this period in history than I do, please add to the conversation. Let's chat in the comment section below and learn together. I'm excited to learn more. We'll see you tomorrow with episode three. Thanks for watching.